this panel, Building a Secure Future, Blockchain-Based Digital Identity Solutions for Improved Security and Record Keeping. Super, super interested in this. Digital ID is a hot topic. I'm going to introduce Inga Bambalete Saliba. I think I did that right. Um, so Inga is a director in the digital advisory team at ANZ, where she helps in institutional clients leverage various technology solutions to solve their complex business problems. And since falling in love with Bitcoin, the Bitcoin white paper in 2017, Inga passionately continues on a quest to understand how decentralized technologies can be used to improve our lives. So Inga, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, no doubt the panelists will do the introductions as well. Enjoy. Thank you, Amorose. Um, just a quick check-in. We're starting a bit late. Are we still okay to stick with 40 minutes for our session? Absolutely. Keep going. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Before introducing the experts on today's panel, I'd actually like to ask everyone, our listeners, a question. What is your most valuable possession? I'm rather confident that my identity is unlikely to make to top five or even top 10 things that comes to mind. Unless you had yours stolen, woken up one day with your life savings uh, drained from your bank accounts or numerous loans taken out against your name. Our identities, um, they're stored in centralized databases that hold this personally identifiable information. That makes them honeypots for cyber criminals. And um, I'm from Lithuania, we may get away with that a bit easier, but especially in Australia, where the high average wealth per person um, here, it attracts probably the world's smartest cyber criminals. And there's another part of our identity, which is com comprised of credentials, personal characteristics, preferences, social attributes. Um, increasingly, these are created or and shared online and even seemingly um, innocent details. When aggregated, they can be just as valuable as a passport number very valuable for cyber criminals who can use it to design a perfect scam that the person is most vulnerable to, um, very val valuable to big tech companies who profit from selling our personal information and the convenience with sign in with Facebook or Gmail that really comes at a greater cost than most realize. So in search for security, tamper-proof records, uh, more decentralization, um, also individual control, some have turned to blockchain-based identity solutions. But can it really um, deliver this improved security that we're after and better record keeping? That's the question that I will be asking my distinguished panel of experts. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mamoun Anwar, Chief Compliance and Innovation Officer at DataZoo. Also Imran Ansari, Co-Founder and Director at Brank. We have Liam Cosgrove, Partnership Manager at the DOCO. Um, also on the line, do I see Lucas? Um, I don't think Lucas is online, but I'm hunting him down at the moment. Okay, um, hopefully we will get Lucas Cullen to join us. He's a visionary at DLTX. And we also have Sam Stewart, Director for Digital Identity at MasterCard. So let's Jim, um, jump straight into the questions. First and foremost, what is wrong with existing digital ID solutions? Um, Imran, you're a co-founder of two companies, uh, whole director, but also chief technology officer roles. I'd like to hear your views on existing solutions for digital identity and record keeping. What works well? What doesn't work? Sure, Inga. Thank you so much for that. First of all, good morning uh, to my co-panelists and everyone joining this. Uh, what a beautiful day uh, to have this conversation about blockchain. Uh, where the market is actually doing really, really well uh, for the one who has invested in blockchain technologies. Uh, now, to come to the questions uh, of you, Inga, like 
As a co-founder and CTO of two companies, I have experience evaluating and selecting digital identity management solutions for record keeping purposes. Now, in my opinion, uh, there are several key aspects that make a digital ID solution effective. Security, the solution should have robust security features to prevent unauthorized access to sensitive data. Scalability is another one. Interoperability, the solution should be able to integrate with uh, other systems. Usability, the solution should be user-friendly and easy to navigate, isn't it? And the most important is the privacy. The solution should prioritize protecting the privacy of users' data. Now, in terms of existing solutions, uh, uh, we have several providers that offer digital ID and record keeping solutions, such as Microsoft Azure Active. Now, let's take an example of one of the organizations that I work for uh, and do consulting of, uh, which is a big ERP uh, from where, when an individual come into the organization, uh, he comes into an ecosystem of the org where the identity has been created and has been shared across the organizations. Another example would be a consumer-based application that we are creating, which is in Brang, uh, where we are actually working with a retail pharmacy for delivering medical supplies. Now, it follows a strict identity management over here, which is achieved by KYC process. Now, what we have done in Brang is adopted a digital scan code uh, approach. The scan barcode digitally verifies the driver for picking up the deliveries and to deliver the right customer. Now, there are a few other examples that we have adopted as kind of a digital ID, which is working, working really, really well. For example, a domestic airline uh, tickets or a vaccine passport that we've been using across. However, as we all know, there are still some challenges with existing solutions. These solutions are fragmented and most importantly are exclusive to organization. When you put that across the organization, it fails in terms of integration. Uh, and a person or an employee or a consumer has to go again and do the same process when he moves from one organization to another. Now what blockchain does, blockchain technology could potentially help address some of these challenges and it has proven actually uh, with improved digital ID solutions in several ways. For instance, blockchain based solution could provide greater security and privacy through digital distributed ledger technology and encryption. Moreover, blockchain-based solution could enable greater interoperability and facilitate data sharing between different systems and organizations, which is the requirement uh, as of for now. Now, one of the important concepts that I bumped into, and we are working actually in Brang, is zero knowledge proof, uh, which is very powerful, I believe, uh, uh, in terms of blockchain space, where a user actually can share the information without actually sharing the information. Uh, you can get verified saying that, okay, this person exists. Uh, and uh, there is, I mean, he's not actually sharing the database to uh, the organization or anyone. So overall, I believe like existing digital ID and record keeping solution works well, but there is still room for improvement. And blockchain technology has the potential to enhance these solutions by improving security, privacy, interoperability, and scalability. Thanks, Simran. I'm actually really um, think that's very important that you highlight that we speak about security. It's a multifaceted concept. It's secure from hacking, but it also needs to be um, secure and safe from the data privacy perspective. And you covered quite a lot of things that I'm keen to really jump in and, and unpack. Um, going to Mamona first, your, uh, sorry, <laughs> next. Your PhD work was focused on blockchain-based digital identity. Um, so I am very interested first, can you explain what a blockchain-based digital ID solution may actually look like? Um, you know, it's, I think, a rich spectrum of from soul bound tokens to uh, verified credentials and anything credentials and anything in between. So what may it look like? And then what's your verdict? Can they really improve security and record keeping? Thank you, Inga. Um, I think I'll echo on what um, Imran and you uh, said earlier that identity, you have defined identity very well, um, but 
uh, identity is not a singular concept. It's a, it's a, uh, it's multi-source. It's uh, anchored into our identity documents that our government issues us, and uh, then we have our shadow identity that we create ourselves by our digital interactions and our digital footprints. Uh, so identity is basically a multi-source concept. Some of the some of the features, some of the attributes of identity we acquire as we go, as we interact, and some of the features that some of the attributes are static that we cannot change. So it's it's a very complex concept in itself. But when we take this definition, multi-source digital identity or compound digital identity uh, on blockchain, uh, we have to keep this in mind that what what should be the components of identity it could be a combination of decentralized identifiers um it could be verifiable credentials tokens uh, encryption keys and of course the underlying personally identifiable data that is anchored into our uh, government identity documents and our shadow identity and then we also um have to consider what does an uh, identity look like end to end. What are the entities? We have uh, identity owner, that is the owner of the identity. We have the issuer, we have verifier, we have service provider. So how uh, these are different views of identity. These, uh, these entities view identity differently. So we have to keep in mind the perspective of identity from all these people, all these entities concept. Um, now, the question here is actually whether this equation of blo uh, blockchain and digital identity is feasible or not. There are many, uh, blockchain is equipped with many tools um, that can make digital identity management interesting um, and secure and flexible. Uh, for example, it can solve the issue of inaccessibility. It can solve the issue of uh, uh, privacy transparency, data integrity is, is one of the things that, that blockchain can address very, um, very well. At the same time, blockchain um, is relatively new in this, uh, in this uh, area of digital identity. We do have some practical solutions, for example, uh, national digital identity system as part of uh, uh, smart initiative, smart nation initiative in Singapore. And then we have Estonian digital identity initiative, which is on government level. Uh, but it's very important that before um, your digital identity management system to blockchain, we identify what we actually need, what type of blockchain is needed. Is it public, private, consortium? Um, what data goes on chain? What data goes off chain? And what is uh, what are the compliance requirements that we have to fulfill by uh, moving digital identity to blockchain? So um, I think from digital identity management, blockchain is a very good technology, but I'm, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit concerned from the record keeping side. Um, is, and it comes back to what, what actually the record is. It's record uh, referring to personally identifiable information, then definitely blockchain might not be the best medium to store that record. Um, at, the, at the end, for this entire end-to-end -end digital identity management ecosystem, we need to have a combination of some off-chain and on-chain arrangement where uh, the tokens or the a decentralized identifier, verifiable credentials can go, and records, some of the records, logging and monitoring can go on chain, and some, there has to be some underlying uh, data storage system, such as interplanetary file system, where we can store our personally identifiable information, underlying personally identifiable information. It will also help us to uh, fulfill compliance requirements. For example, GDPR's requirement of right to be forgotten which is not possible keeping in mind the immutability of blockchain. But if that information is stored in some underlying storage system, then definitely we can uh, implement, uh, identity owners can exercise their right to, right to forget the information. So I think it uh, comes back to the, how we design the solution. And blockchain definitely has potential uh, to enhance the privacy, security, and compliance of digital identity management. Thank you. That's brilliant. That's, um, I think, what it points to remember that just because we're speaking about the blockchain or decentralized ledger technologies, it does not mean neither that everything will be decentralized nor that, you know, everything should be stored on chain. So that aspect of 
related decentralized storage technologies um, that are also evolving is a very good point and something that should be considered as the end-to-end -end part of the solution. I'd like to bring uh, Liam you to the conversation here because you work at the company that uses blockchain for document management. So can you speak um, about the doco, what the solutions, like how the solution looks like and what is actually stored on chain? Sure, thanks Aniga and good morning everyone. Um, and, and I'm really picking up on that point around the related uh, documents to be stored on chain or not and that decentralized nature. So we've actually chosen the blockchain as a source of truth and trust for documents and records. And this is due to the independent verifiability of data uh, due to its immutability being on chain. Uh, combining this with the accessing of sensitive information, this becomes a really powerful system for enterprises and governments. Uh, but there is, of course, a, a trade-off of, of how this data is stored. We can't just put all this sensitive data on chain because of its permanence. It can't be deleted or manipulated once it's there. Uh, this permanence and publicity uh, or public um, information being on chain is at the core of enterprises challenging challenges to actually adopting blockchain. So not wanting to store sensitive information or records uh, publicly, we can really understand why you wouldn't want to do that. And that permanence means that the data stored is actually there forever. So however, the less you put on the chain, the less valuable the information is to actually verify and ensure the immutability and quality of that record. So the ability to independently verify means you don't need to ask any third party providers to verify that information for you, which is only possible on chain with decentralized information. What this means is if Dodoco, for example, no longer existed as an entity, you could still go and verify this information on chain. If we didn't use blockchain, we would just be another centralized authority with questionable reliability. So there is a compromise being able to verify that information, but ensuring sensitive information is safe and secure. So we've overcome this compromise by linking the process of the document and hashing this onto the chain. So the document or record itself is not exposed publicly, only the audit trail, which is ideal from a compliance perspective. The hash is very much like a thumbprint or a fingerprint. This information cannot be reverse engineered or hacked, so you can be confident that your data is safe in a public or as some enterprises prefer on private change, which is more like a, an on-prem solution. So for blockchain enthusiasts, you, you hear a lot about soul bound tokens, which um, if you're not sure what those are or not familiar, this is a token that's linked to specific individuals and their access rights. And these are completely immutable, i.e. they're unchangeable. An example would be to use the issuing of a university certificate. So we've actually developed something similar, uh, but in the form of an NFD process. So non fungible document process where we can issue any documents, so the certificate um, for university, that again is completely immutable. So the audit trail itself belongs to the document. It's decentralized in its nature. So anyone with that original can verify the documents, which dramatically improves the way we manage records, making the way for true interoperability of records whilst ensuring data security uh, and data and sovereignty are adhered to. Thank you. That's I think was a really good summary to also explain why blockchain can be better than the standard management of central databases and that point around independent verifiability. And I think combined with what we can achieve on chain, which is instant verifiability, are some of the aspects that we really could use the blockchain-based technology and attributes to. Um, I'll move to i think okay we do we do have lucas here i'll i do want to um get your perspective lucas here because i know you spend over a decade working with blockchain based tech stack building dapps decentralized applications am i also correct saying that you actually build a decentralized id application yeah that's correct so i've been like you said in the game for a long time and i've seen a few of these projects or protocols come up. I was part of 
uh, the Accenture ID 2020, if everyone remembers that, launched back in 2016. You know, fast forward three years, where is that? Where is that project really now? Where's the adoption? So I think there's, you know, a lot of things that need to be solved here to get up to, you know, what we all see is this federated ID management system um, that's ubiquitous and agnostic to vendors. Uh, so, yeah, I've built an app called Item, which is using some of the um, standards that a lot of people have talked to here today, um, decentralized ID um, DIDs, uh, decentralized ID identifiers, <clears throat> and, and verifiable credentials. So our premise is that we store that information on a mobile device and only post it to a traditional Web 2 or Web 3 app when the user consents to that. Um, I think there's a, there's a good conversation here, but I think, you know, blockchain isn't also the panacea here. Like the ID Federation, um, the, you know, the Open ID Federation actually came out in 2002 and I was, I was part of that since, um, and, and Facebook adopted that and, and, and dropped it in like 2018. Um, so we've seen, you know, a lot of attempts at decentralized ID. And I think what um, will happen hopefully is a chain like uh, Ethereum will actually tie all this together. So we're seeing, you know, decentralized ID in a format or, or authentication such as Facebook authentication, where you set it great off to someone, they have the authority to verify that email and then come back to you. What I'm hoping here is that we have a chain or some kind of repository that then we can, or developers or consumers can then go to one source of truth and that be, you know, the answer to yes or no, rather than segueing to Apple uh, or another third party provider. Like, like I said, we've seen other providers who have tried Ubuntu and stuff, but never really got that adoption. So I'm hoping that we take that power out of the hands of the big corps and put it into some kind of chain or repository or some kind of public um, record rather than a private uh, company based records. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and I think the point, there's no single technology that's neither a panacea, but also it shouldn't be a single technology. We want a range of different solutions. And to your point, I think the, there's a big role for open interoperable standards um, so we can achieve that choice and also wide usability. I'll go back to, uh, I'll come back to the adoption point you mentioned a little bit later. But before that, I think quite a few things you mentioned may also resonate with Sam. Uh, so Sam, you lead the team at MasterCard on a very great mission to scale reusable digital ID in Australia. Can you speak about your experience? And I think as of today, publicly, um, public knowledge that there's some great work you have done with the New South Wales government. Um, floor is yours. Thanks, Inga. And I've got to agree, actually, with, with Lucas kind of straight out of the gate. We, um, you know, I think blockchain is 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 part of this. It's it's not a panacea. It's not the holy grail. Um, when I when I think about uh, digital identity and what we're trying to solve here, this is use case driven. Um, we need to build this ecosystem. We need acceptance. We need uh, utility utility and ubiquity with actually using it. Um, so from our perspective, we've taken a bit of a different approach. Um, we've assessed and we've looked at blockchain and we're continuously evolving that and, and looking at how it comes into our ecosystem. As Lucas said, uh, you know, VCs, verifiable credentials and um, DIDs, you know, de decentralized identifiers, they're critical to us to, to build this out. And, and I think when we think about uh, the knowledge, the zero knowledge proof, that, that's absolutely important. But I think when I think about what customers, what what organizations, what businesses are crying for at the moment, and, and the big driver here is how do we uh, verify an individual to a good level, a highly assured individual, and only share the data that we need? All the recent breaches kind of really compound and show that we should only be sharing information that's really need, needed. You know, I don't need to share all my document details. I don't need to share uh, my date of birth. I should be able to share a minimal set of information to a business so they can verify that I am that person. So when I think about blockchain and, and how it um, how it really comes together with the both the, the, the private, private and the public sector, for us at MasterCard, we have taken an approach to look at how do we create a pseudo decentralized uh, model, but also federated. You know, we need to fit in with government standards like the trusted digital identity framework. Um, and how we look at it is we've actually decentralized by storing the identity on the device. So the the identity is is enrolled it's stored on the device and the trusted enclave and as lucas actually called out earlier we then share that 
and um, share that information only on consent of um, from the individual. So for us, it's about empowering individuals to be able to safely store and secure their information. And for businesses, how do we give them the ability to um, to consume a, a, a highly verified digital identity? So I think the two worlds are coming together. I think uh, it's not necessarily a technology problem. I think there's different ways to solve it. I think blockchain and VCs absolutely have a critical role in that, but it's for particular use cases. When you even think about um, Service New South Wales, um, and, and you mentioned um, we'd be, we've been partnering with them and we've started to roll out um, a pilot around age verification, so only sharing an age over flag. But they're also investing heavily in VCs. You know, they want to build out VCs and they want to enable small businesses to accept those. You know, where it is my... Um, you know, my son's um, basketball team and I need to show her, show the uh, the birth certificate. How do you share that quickly and easily without having to share a whole whole raft of information? So I think these two worlds are coming together. Uh, when I think about it, it's, it's important to have the principles that are driven through SSI, um, you know, consent and data minimization. But ultimately, I see this as, as a problem that's use case driven. Uh, we've got to build an ecosystem uh, together, both government, private sector, blockchain technology, technology, standard technology, you know, leveraging previous um, previous uh, um, standards like OIDC and, and OAuth. I think it's all coming together, and we've just got to really work together together to to build out the acceptance and 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 build out those use cases. To me, that's what's going to drive this forward. Yeah, couldn't couldn't really agree more. And and going back to what um, Mamona said, there's there's an issue. There's a user. There's a verifier. It's an end-to-end ecosystem. It really needs to one work for everyone. But when designing digital IDs, we have to consider each party. Um, and the big aspect of this, you know, we can have great technology solutions, but it's only useful if used. So you touched on the adoption, uh, so did Lucas. I'm keen to hear your thoughts, Imran. What are the biggest challenges in your view and barriers for adoption? Sure, I think a couple of points mentioned by Sam and Lucas and Marina resonate. It's uh, pretty much like technology is there. Uh, it's more of adoption, like if you consider uh, there are two aspects to it. One is a consumer adoption and one is a business adoption. Uh, and I believe like uh, uh, what hinders is the lack of awareness and education over here. Uh, it has to be a very, very simplified way of educating uh, audiences about uh, what the advantages are for blockchain uh, digital identity over here. Uh, and perhaps like I also believe like uh, uh, lack of regulations, which is actually causing a lot of hindrance over here. Um, um, it has to be adopted. Uh, it has to be presented in a way uh, that a uh, user feels like uh, they are protected. Um, they can share their identity in blockchain and they uh, they leave the trust factor or they, they, they get the trust factor over there. Uh, and that is where like, I think one of the examples that I want to point out is uh, a passport of an individual, uh, uh, which is like a government issued. He can go anywhere uh, using that passport and it has been adopted, it has been accepted. Uh, but the governments, uh, different governments, they all have their own passport. Like Sam mentioned, there are different use cases over here. So they ha all have their own passports, which is, uh, yeah, which is uh, promoted by the uh, centralized government, though. Uh, but still, there is a legal framework to it. Uh, so I believe, like, uh, um, I think adoption will increase uh, if there is a bit of regulations and uh, trust factor has been enforced uh, very well uh, within this uh, technology. Thank you. Um, Sam would, sorry, um, uh, Liam, would you agree? And is there anything else to add when it comes to adoption in your view? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Imran, uh, especially around the passport um, as, a, as a document, as a, as a piece of ID. And you mentioned um, zero knowledge proofs before. Uh, being able to verify, again, that information in real time. And I think it's kind of clear the combination of, of both, uh, let's call it Web3 or decentralized with the, with the Web2 and that convergence of bringing that information together so that we can use our wonderful uh, Web2 ecosystem and products uh, that we're all used to, but leveraging what is the, the back end here um, that allows information to be completely immutable, uh, that we can actually trust the records that we see and be able 
able to do that uh, in real time. Uh, that infrastructure, I think, is is key to to bring forward using all the examples of, of breaches and, and where that data is shared. Do we want to trust that data with another third party trusted advisor? I think that's probably one of the challenges um, that we face today or businesses do. And we have these great gated communities on on prem or, or using cloud um, servers with our high security profiles. Uh, but we then choose to share that information with others. So just being able to bring that infrastructure uh, almost in-house or within uh, those gated um, data requirements uh, and be able to keep that there, I think is going to be key to the adoption uh, and building trust between consumers and brands of who is the custodian of that data. If it's the business or government that you've entrusted with that, that only they keep that information and they're not sharing that with, with more. I think that's the, the change and shift that we're, we're starting to see and I think will be demanded through um, customers. Thank you. And very quickly, I do want to shift the topic slightly to that aspect of our identity, you know, the reputation, the records of credibility and other data that is linked to our identity increasingly stored online, um, very much uh, locked with centralized providers currently, neither secure from misuse nor really portable. So is there a role for blockchain-based solutions here when we move towards this kind of next iteration of internet and our digital lives, what could a good solution look like uh, Mamuna, uh, keen to kind of get your view into the future. Yeah, um, uh, I think the future that everybody is talking about you know, at, at the moment is Web 3.0 metaverse, um, which is still at very early stage, but it is approaching very quickly. So, which means that we need to act now, otherwise we will be operating in a world that is created by someone else and for someone else. So um, I, I think um, for future, um, single solution is one unified uh, global digital identity management system that can, uh, that can enable, as, as Imran said, interoperability that can operate globally. There has to be one system, unified system um, and that we can have. Of course, the adoption will be challenging and uh, we also need to, re to regulate metaverse to regulate the future um, uh, version of internet before we can build solutions for that. Uh, plus, uh, there is uh, education piece. Uh, the consumers, the identity owners, right now, um, they just recently got gotten used to of using these digital, apps, especially in the time of COVID. Uh, they they made them so familiar with the digital identity uh, verification solution. Now, if we introduce uh, Web3 and metaverse-based digital identity solutions, we need to educate them first. And this will happen over the period of time, not at once. So um, I think if we introduce uh, solutions now, we will be prepared by the time metaverse becomes mainstream. Couldn't agree more. I always say uh, education about data privacy um, and importance of it should start as early as uh, kindergarten. Um, before I tend um, to speak too much on that topic, I would love to hear from you, Lucas. You're the visionary. So what is your vision for the future? You know, will it include true SSI, the self-sovereign IDs is gonna be blockchain based? And if so, um, what are the risks? Can we overcome it? Something that, to a bonus point, that should be uh, already uh, start built today? Yeah, um, well, that's a good question. So what I'm hearing now is like the, the word DID come up a lot. And this is, um, this is actually coincidental for you know, disclosure. The panel got together and we actually had these conversations. And it was refreshing to hear that a lot of the community, through their own research, have started to land upon these standards and then having these kind of conversations, uh, reinforcing those to tech decisions, which is always great. Um, early adopters, you know, take a leap of faith on what they believe the standards and, you know, the technology will go. And it seems like we're all circling around the right technology. And what that means is that, you know, when MasterCard or ANZ or someone come on and choose this standard, then hopefully we have a you know, a very interoperable um, solutions, which will then, you know, expedite adoption if we have 
different frameworks and standards and that will you know degrade that um, adoption and you know in a, in a decentralized uh, community-based um, uh, environment it's hard to get consensus and everyone has compelling ideas so that's one thing and it's really refreshing to hear that so I think we're generally on the right um, path there um, some other you know um, perhaps red flags for adoption is as mentioned is you know potentially the government and their um, you know they're perhaps weakening on encryption is a bit of a concern we're seeing the tornado cash um, uh, thing play out which is actually has is concerns for developers so I think we need a little bit more clarity on how we can use encryption because all these uh, technologies are, are heavily reliant on encryption and we need signals from the government that this can be used in, in a manner that is beneficial for everyone uh, and not, you know, and not trying to erode that um, strong encryption because otherwise some of these conversations are moot. So like I said, I think we're on the right path uh, and it's good to see, uh, encourage, you know, startups and uh, to look at these technologies and you know the more you know the more investment we get in and the more um, players that want to you know participate in these standards and the, the likelihood of adoption is greater. Thank you and I think it's evident even from you know yourselves such a diverse panel of experts but largely everyone agrees and I think first is just starts when we need digital ID then you know we do need specific uh, open interoperable standards that digital IDs are built on. Um, one of my other key takeaways is this principle of minimal disclosure of data on a need to know only basis. So yes, it's clear that there's components of the solutions um, uh, required to create a more secure digital IDs that can come from the blockchain uh, technology, zero knowledge proofs is a good example. Um, the centralized consensus of blockchain is really good for these kind of fraud uh, proof type of records. Um, but very much whatever is designed will have to be use case driven. Back to the point mentioned, um, you know, it's a multifaceted aspect when we speak about the anyone's identity, really. And to make any kind of solution work, the government will need to work very closely with the private sector. And from what you mentioned, you know, it's essential to consider governance, very much legislation to Lucas' point, and also incentives for each parties of the ecosystem, the issuer, the holder, the verifier, there needs to be commercial incentives for the private sector. And the government will have to, you know, government is a bunch of people so it will have to be both influenced by an educated um, uh, society electing the government. And I think that education, to Mamona's point, is just such an important foundation for both effective collaboration, but also assessing the choices of data that we have. I want to thank you again, uh, everyone who joined the session and my amazing panelists. It was a uh, very fun and interesting to have this conversation. Well, I have a million more questions to ask. We're just uh, out of time and I will be handing over back to Amy Rose. Thank you everyone and have a great week.